Welcome to Scale Her Up. I'm Brenda Hector, and with me today is my I've known, my friend I've known for years, um, Rachel Fife from Tartan Competitions. Rachel, thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me, Brenda. Oh no, you've got a brilliant story, so it's um it's about time that we uh we got you interviewed. So yeah, ha- let's where will we start? What what do you do at Tartan Competitions? Uh, basically, we raffle off prizes. People buy tickets and hopefully win something at some point. And how long have you been doing that? Um, it'll be three years in June, actually. And um, as competition businesses go, we're still pretty small. <laughs> um, we haven't grown quite as quickly as some others out there, but that's okay. Um, we have grown steadily and that's all right too. So, yeah, let, let's go back to the beginning then. Why did okay. you... Why did you actually no? Let's start. You've got a really interesting entrepreneurial journey. So let's let's just start at the beginning. What was your What was your yeah? Tell us tell us your your story. Well, it's it's funny because you use that word entrepreneur, and that's not at all <laughs> um, a word that I think of myself being. Um, uh, jack of all trades might be a better. <laughs> No, um, you're you're not the first person to come on this podcast and I say entrepreneur or businesswoman and they go, oh, I don't think of myself as that. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. It's weird. It's it's probably part of that, I don't know, lack of self-esteem, isn't it, um, that can be found in a lot of people. But anywho, um, well, <laughs> I do have a very varied uh, working life, shall we say. Um. I initially went into the hospitality industry after school um, for my sins and um, managed restaurants, uh, managed an outside catering company, things like that. And uh, when I fell pregnant with my son, I thought, hmm, not very family friendly hours. (laughs) And uh, yeah, the the business that I was working with, uh, I did think about going part time and things like that, but because I was the main front face for it, if you like, in the in managing all the events. I just, I didn't feel that part-time would work very well. I felt like I would be getting phone calls all the time, you know, try to fight fires and things like that. So I decided to step away from it completely. So uh, when I, had, at the end of my maternity leave, decided that I wasn't, I wasn't returning. And um, I actually started working in supermarkets at that point, just to have something um, mm-hmm. to bring in some money. But um, I was working night shift. I was only sleeping when my son was napping, which isn't very sustainable. And um, at that point, a friend of mine, an ex-work colleague actually, had started doing body shop parties. So I had a party for her, as you do, to support your friends. And uh, she said to me at the end of the night, oh, I've made 100 quid tonight. And I was like, excuse me, <laughs> pardon? I'll have some of that. Thank you very much. And um, so I worked with the body shop at home for three and a half years, started just doing parties in people's houses and uh, then built a team and became an area manager with that and did that all throughout my second pregnancy actually as well um, with my daughter. Left the supermarkets very quickly once I started that and um, yeah, worked through all my pregnancy, went back to work doing parties uh, very quickly after having my daughter as well because as a self-employed person, you're you know not guaranteed any income. There's no big maternity pay um, and things like that. So, uh, but it worked brilliantly. My t- husband at the time was working for the council. So he was home at a reasonable hour, which meant I could go out in the evenings and and do parties and things like that as well. And then whilst I was doing that and uh, having had two children, my mum had started going to a Slimmer World group and uh, trying to lose weight. And I thought, oh yeah, fancy losing a few pounds actually after having two kids. And uh, went along and again, the opportunity kind of was there and I thought, oh, I could maybe do that <laughs> um, to become a Slimmer World consultant. I went along to what they call an opportunity event, heard about it and thought, yep, I could I could do that. And actually I could do them both. And I did for a while. I ran Slimmer World groups and I still did my body shop parties and um, did them both for a while. And then kind of uh, very quickly progressed with Slimmer World from one group to two groups actually I, I took over a second group within a month of me <laughs> launching the first group actually um with Slim World and um and then went on and had a third group 
um, as well. And uh, with being out three nights through the week, I kind of thought, actually, I could maybe get my weekends back because, of course, the body shop parties were all at the weekends. Well, a, a lot of them were. Um, so sort of wound down the body shop business and uh, just kept going with Slimworld. And uh, Slimworld, as a consultant, you're again, you're self-employed. So um, as much as you're a, a franchise holder, um, you are kind of your own boss with that. And and again, I built a team there, became a team developer with Slimworld. Um, and as the kids kind of got older, my daughter was starting, um, going to nursery and starting, going to be starting primary one. And um, the opportunity kind of, came to apply to become a district manager with Slum World. So um, the district that we are in, of course, is the north of Scotland, which has very large geography. Um, there was quite a few hoops to jump through for that one, which I had never done anything like that before. There were, um, you know, I had to do a presentation. There was um, sort of personality tests, if you like, to make sure that you're the right person. It was it was very out of my comfort zone. Um, I don't know if they do a lot of that in the corporate world because I've never worked in the corporate world, but I think it might be something similar to that. And um, and I, I I became a district manager and did that for uh, almost three and a half years. So all in all, I, I worked with Slimworld for almost 10 years, actually, um, which is the longest job I've ever had <laughs> so far. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was great. I, was, I did a lot of traveling. Um, with Slumworld, my district was from Fife to Thurso um, initially, so it was like seven hours from top to bottom. But the, the difficulty I found the longer I did Slumworld was um, the more I did, the more they wanted, for want of a better phrase. And um, I felt like I was never home. And my kids, the, by this point, um, one had already started academy, one was heading towards academy. And um, I, I wanted to be there to support them um, through their teenage years because it's not just when they're little that they need you. It's it's kind of later in life too. And yeah, it was it was either end up in Cornhill or or leave. So I did, and um, I, I'm terrible for jumping feet first. Um, in other words, I left without another job and thought, right, what can I do? <laughs> I'll do anything. Um, and uh, was just sort of thinking of lots of things. Um, I'm a firm believer in if you put the work in, you can do anything. And and these days there are there are various methods. You know, you don't have to go back to college. You don't have to go to university. Um, you know, there's training courses galore. Um, if you look hard enough for what it is that you want to do. And um, I have a little room in my house that I thought, what can I do with this room where I'm actually home and I'm actually here and I don't have to be driving for four hours a day and um. And the thought of facing town traffic, heading in and out of town for something each day, just, oh, it wasn't something that I wanted to consider at all. Um, and I could have gone back into hospitality. You know, there are various things, but I didn't want that either. And, um, yeah, so I had to put my thinking cap on. Thought back to, actually, what what would I really love? I love, um, I love getting my nails done. And actually, when I was at school, I... I actually originally wanted to be a hairdresser. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and But hairdressing requires a lot of training, <laughs> a lot of practice. Um, so I looked into various beauty courses and um, I did a nail course. I did a waxing course. I did um, eyebrow tinting and whatever courses. So I just did a few courses here and there and set up my own little home salon. Um, my husband, whilst, whilst he had... Um, Whilst I had been working with Slumworld, he had actually given up his job with the council and had his own dog walking business. Um, so we were both self-employed then. <laughs> and uh, so with my little home salon, it grew quite quickly, actually. There was obviously a need in the area for that. Um, and within about six months, I was really quite busy. I wasn't full at that point. Um, but I was, you know, busy enough to be making a decent income and um, and at home, <laughs> which was the main aim. And uh, and then COVID struck very quickly afterwards because that was um, it was August two thousand nineteen. I started my little beauty business and um, and of course March twenty twenty, the world went crazy. Um, so, with my husband being self employed and me being self employed, we, we lost our income overnight, essentially. And um, quite truthfully, if it hadn't been for the mortgage payment holidays, we pro probably would have lost our house. 
um, which is a scary thought uh, because of when I had went back into self-employment because as a district manager of the Slim World, I was fully employed. Um, when I went back into self-employment, because of the timing, I didn't qualify for any grants, actually, um, until 13 months after the first lockdown was when I got a first grant. Uh, so my I had nothing to contribute, um, for want of a better phrase. It was, and, uh, it was an unbelievable time, actually, looking back. I yeah. can't quite believe that what happened then, you I know. know. I know. Yeah. And um, my husband did uh, uh, qualify for some grants, but he, because it took into account, like your first year in business, because when he had started his, his dog walking business, so the grant amounts weren't a lot because it had averaged over the, the previous three years, taking that first year into account. Uh, so he actually started delivering parcels with Amazon <laughs> just to try and get some money, just to help us survive, really. Um, so, of course, we annihilated our savings <laughs> during that time. We um, just did whatever we could just to survive, um, you know, built up a load of credit card debt and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, just did what we had to do. So when we could get back to work, we we did. Um, the issue for my husband was that he you know people had been walking their own dogs and were still working from home so a lot of them could still walk their own dogs um so his business wasn't going to bounce back in quite the same way as as mine did um i mean i was it was it was <laughs> it was a crazy time because you know you, we were open for a period then we were shut down again then we were open for a period and then we were shut down again it was it was like here's a little bit of money keep you going the next few months while we shut you down again um, so once we were kind of back to maybe working a lot of the time, we, we kind of thought, right, what are we going to do to get ourselves back on our, our feet properly? What's what's the plan here? We're going to need a second income. And uh, God forbid, if there's any more lockdowns, we need money. Um, so we looked into various things because my husband had been delivering parcels with Amazon we even looked into perhaps setting up um, an Amazon delivery company which you can do as well but there's huge financial costs involved in that the logistics the uh, yeah it, it would be a lot more time consuming in the fact that we would be trying to still do our other jobs as well as that because we still needed that money coming in because we had a lot of debt to repay and things as well um, so we looked at all sorts of things and um, the competition businesses was was one of them. So um, although, you know, we're, we're, although we're mature, we're fairly tech savvy, but not as tech savvy as to create websites and things. Um, so it was a huge learning curve um, initially. A lot of research, a lot of looking at other businesses like that, seeing um, the kinds of things that they did, a lot of Googling. <laughs> um, with regards to research. <laughs> yeah, definitely um just to see you know what was what and actually could we afford to even set it up initially you know because obviously there are huge well can be huge costs involved um in in just setting up websites and things and your web hosting and everything else so um we decided it was worth the risk basically and yeah just get got go and find a web designer um one of the things that we wanted to do with our competition business, because our own businesses had been affected so badly with COVID, we we wanted to try and support local businesses where we could. So we used a, a web designer that lives in Bankley, actually. Um, and she was she was great initially. You know, she designed our logo and everything as well. So she's a graphic designer as well. Um, so she was she was cracking and she was very upfront about costs and um, allowed us to sort of pay bits and pieces along the way as well. Um, so that really helped us get started and, and off our feet initially as well. Um, but she, you know, held her hands up and was like, I've not done this kind of website before. So it was a bit of a learning curve for, um, on both fronts um, in there. And that initial website we we launched with, but she could only take us so far. So further down the line, we did have to, to go elsewhere. Um, but, you know, she really helped us get on our feet initially um, and get started. We had... So, um, you, sorry. Yeah, you, you told a story to me... Um... Uh, a wee while ago about a, a bit of a delay in getting started yeah the competition that the competition competitions that yes. um, yeah yeah well obviously uh, um for those of 
the you listening who know Aberdeen, the Aberdeen area, there is a massive um competition business up in the set, neck of the woods. And um, of course, they because they were so massive, they inspired lots of other people <laughs> to um look into and start, I guess, competition businesses. They initially our web designer was was fabulous, but we needed a a web developer, if you like, to help us with hosting the website, making sure it was lovely and secure for customers, mm-hmm. um, you know, parting with their hard-earned cash um, for tickets. So um, we initially had, the web developer we initially had, uh, for want of a better phrase, was rubbish. <laughs> didn't do what he said he would do and certainly didn't do it in the time scale that we needed him to do it in or that he said he could do it in. Um, so we actually were delayed three months. We should have launched in March 2021. But um, after many, many back and forths and actually sometimes not even getting a response, we uh, sacked him off <laughs> and uh, had to find another web developer and hosting um, sort of agent, if you like. And uh, we didn't end up launching until June 2021. And in that three months, there were 25 uh, that I know of local, I say local meaning across Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire, Angus, that kind of area, um, 25 local competition businesses that launched in that three months we were delayed. And we were like every day going on Facebook and there was another one popping up and another one. And we were just, oh, we were like, oh my God, what do we do? Um, but we felt that we'd we'd spent so much time and money so far we couldn't we couldn't go backwards we couldn't not do it or delay any further we just had to hit and hope really, um for one of a better phrase and uh, yeah so we launched in in June twenty twenty one and actually slowly that of those twenty five that start set up in that that three months that we were delayed I mean there have been others since as well. Um, but out of those 25, there's actually only four remaining now. Mm-hmm. And that I know of, because <laughs> again, there there might be ones out there that I've not heard of yet. Um, but yeah, there's only four going now. And we were kind of watching what they were doing. And some of them, even though, because obviously you have to build followers, you have to build um, a customer base of people that are willing to part with their money for tickets. And because with, without that customer base, you could have the best prize in the world. But without enough people to buy a ticket for it, they're never you're never going to make money on it. You know, you're never ever going to be able to sell enough tickets to even cover the cost of it. Never mind anything else, because um, contrary to popular belief, our prizes aren't donated. We buy them <laughs> um, because a lot of people think this kind of business that we get things donated. We do not. <laughs> that is not the case at all. Um, so we do have to cover the costs of not only the prize, but the transaction fees um you know the the web hosting the the continued web development you know there's all sorts of other fees that go into it as well um so we were watching some of these other businesses that set up and and we felt that some of them were trying to go too big too soon um if you like in order to compete with the big competition businesses out there which you know i get um but what we have tried to do from the very start is not compete with the big businesses that are out there but but hopefully do prizes that appeal to people um, that, you know, is, is maybe something that they would really like, but maybe don't have the extra few hundred pounds to to shell out on that. Um, but would love to win it for, you know, 99p a ticket or 199 a ticket um, or what have you. And we're not quite at the life changing prizes just yet, but we hope to get there um, eventually. That's for sure. Do you know, I'm, I'm listening to that story, Rachel, and I start off, you said you went into hospitality and you were managing events and, and you know, the transferable skills that you developed there, I'm kind of, I'm seeing that that's been, been relevant in everything, probably everything else that you've done since. Um, yeah, I mean, it's people skills, I guess, is something that can never, never go amiss, if you like, um. You know, in in a lot of the industries um, that I've been in, you know, there have been a few others in there as well that I've not told you about. <laughs> uh, there are people talking to people, the ability to, um, I don't know, relate to people, I guess, in some ways, uh, is, is a skill that helps in so many different areas. 
um, I guess, you know, uh, if you can imagine the hospitality industry dealing with complaints is one of the most challenging things. And actually, it was no different with Slimworld, actually, as well. As a district manager of Slimworld, the amount of complaints I had to deal with there um, was very challenging as well. Um, this kind of thing, like, for example, today, the podcast kind of thing, and um, and even going live on Facebook to do our live draws with the competitions, you know, it's it's something that I'm well out of practice with. Of course, I used to, you know, stand up in some more groups and talk to a room full of people, but it didn't feel like you were, I don't know, hosting anything. You were just chatting to people that you, you saw every week and um and catching up. And I have gotten used to to being on live on, on Facebook with our live draws. Um, I don't listen back because, you know, nobody likes the sound of their own voice. And uh, <laughs> but you do, you get used to it. But I haven't quite gotten used to it that I'm prepared to go live like five times a day. That's near me. <laughs> It'll never will be me. Um, but yeah, there, there, I guess people skills and things. One thing that actually with the competition industry um, and the fact that I was saying, you know, that we're still relatively small and we maybe haven't grown quite as quickly as others. <laughs> With a lot of other competition businesses, not them all, but a few of them, um, I don't know if, if people like to dramatise things for effect, for, it's a bit like clickbait, isn't it? You know, with the, your newspaper articles and things like that. And I just, I can't bring myself to do that. <laughs> I think one thing with, with us, with our business and what you get, what you see is what you get, essentially. We're we're very real people. We're um, trying to, make a better life for ourselves but hopefully trying to make a better life for other people along the way as well and, and winning some prizes and things um you know we've we've had a lot of local winners which is lovely we've we've met and got to know quite a few of our customers which is even you know was something we never ever thought would happen either um do you know so that there are there are loads of positives to it but there are certain things that I think I don't know whether it's because of our age nowadays or <laughs> with the experience that we've had in the past there's certainly certain things that I'm not prepared to do with our business that others are prepared to do and whether that slowed us down a bit that's okay I'll accept that because I'm not willing to do the things that might make us grow quicker like what 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 are the what, you know so you've got you've got your well like I was saying your boundaries what what are we yeah. talking about there well like I was saying even about the, the going live thing I know that there are other businesses out there who who go live on Facebook many many times a day but that's just not I actually switched off from some of those competition pages because to me that's that's annoying <laughs> and there's, I don't want that for our business they're sharing a lot of their life that yeah yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, definitely uh, going live just for the sake of it or, or going live to dramatise their own life out there. And that's just and, and that's great for them. If that's what they want. To, I'm not criticising them for that, but that's not something that we want to do for our business. Um, it's just not us. <laughs> you know, we're, we're very normal country people. <laughs> just I don't know. Yeah, it, it's just so and. and even things like, um, so a lot of businesses like ours send out marketing texts and uh, we have not ever sent out a marketing text um, so far. Never say never because, you know, there might be some day that we need to to break even on a prize or something like that. But uh, for me personally, I find them annoying. So I don't want to do them to, to our customers because I don't want anybody else out there feeling that we're being annoying. Um, uh, intrusive. That, yes. that yeah, word? yeah, that's a good word for it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, definitely. I mean, there are obviously we have to be out there. I do do marketing emails. Um, we have to be live to to draw various things, and you know, I might do extra lives if there's something really exciting to tell people, um, and things like that. But yeah, there's just certain things that I don't want to do, <laughs> so I'm not gonna. <laughs> so social social media is your main marketing channels yeah absolutely um you name it we're on it um we're facebook is is one of the main and um, that's where we have the most followers on our facebook page uh even our, our facebook page actually has a a risk if you like our business and um, the competition industry is classed as a high risk business um, Facebook doesn't like us either, actually, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and there are various things, words, all sorts on Facebook that can actually trigger um, Facebook to shut the page down. 
um, which is, is the extreme. But I do know other competition businesses out there who have had their pages shut down. Um, so there are various uh, words and things we try not to use too much on our posts because Facebook will flag it up and there's like so many warnings that you get. And actually, the more warnings you get, the less visible your page becomes, the less people your, your page shows your content to. Mm. Uh, which is cheeky <laughs> in my eyes. Facebook needs to sort itself out. Even yesterday, actually, I don't know what's been going on with Facebook lately, but yesterday, our Facebook followers said zero yesterday. And I was like, where'd everybody go? Um, Facebook has various glitches and it isn't, isn't the best um, for our public pages because, of course, Facebook want to make money out of us as well. So really for anybody with a business page, not just for competition industries, but anybody with a, with a business page on Facebook, they want you to boost, pay to boost your post, to pay to boost your page. Um, when actually, in my eyes, if someone has chosen to follow our page, they should be getting shown everything we're putting up because they've chosen to follow us, um, as in any business out there. So it, it's frustrating. Yeah. So there's um, a lot, of, a lot of control. You, you don't have control of of that, yeah. that marketing channel and yeah. yeah i've i've spoken to a lot of businesses that have had um similar challenges one that used a lot of google and that was taken down and yes. yeah yeah it's it's a challenge so we do also have a facebook group as well where um we probably feel we have slightly more control over our closed facebook group and um some competition businesses out there actually their group is more has more people in it than their business page has mm -hmm. um, because they feel they, they have that bit more control. So um, we're kind of working to try and build our group on Facebook up at the moment um, with genuine people, you know, because another issue that we have as a competition business, especially with Facebook, because obviously to try and gain new followers, we do free giveaways. Mm -hmm. um a lot <laughs> not a lot but quite often we do free giveaways try and boost our followers try and hopefully um encourage our existing players to share our page with potential new players and uh but there is a group of facebook people out there and it's a huge bugbear of mine who are what i call career compers so basically they are they come from all over the uk they have their own group set up where they only share different free things that they find on Facebook. And uh, they jump on every free Facebook post out there. And they will never, ever spend a penny with any business that they're sharing these these free things from. And it's not just competition business. It could be, I don't know, a restaurant giving away a voucher. It could be, um, you know, somebody uh, recently, there was quite a lot of people doing Easter freebies to try and increase their following, not competition businesses, but the other businesses out there. And they were all jumping on the bandwagon. So it's not that I'm against people applying, to, uh, you know, entering something for free, not at all, but they abuse the system. They sort of flood your freebies and will never ever spend with any of those businesses and they sort of push out the people who do support these businesses um so yeah with with the closed group you've got an element more of control with that um yeah. because actually i could not allow those freebie compers in yeah yeah uh because they, they just bug me <laughs> So has it been a big um a big learning curve? Oh, absolutely. It still is. Still is. Yeah. Um absolutely still is. Even even things like um like the other social media channels. So obviously the, the most recent one is threads. Um it's like how on earth do I use that? <laughs> um, but I have been using it and actually we've got over 550 followers on there now, which is very strange. I don't know what I'm doing, but I just, you know, repeat a lot of the posts that I'm putting everywhere else. Um Instagram. The fact, one another bugbear of mine as well, actually, is the fact that you cannot stream to Facebook and Instagram at the same time. Like, they're owned by the same people. Why can't we stream to the, to both of them at the same time? Like, that makes no sense. Um, is it still Zuckerberg that owns all of that? Get on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, if he's listening, <laughs> of course yeah, he listens. Just to send, send it to him, Brenda. <laughs> Christ. Um, like why it's just it's, it doesn't make sense at all um so we haven't really cracked the live 
side of things on Instagram. We could do separate lives, of course we could, but then you, I would feel like I was repeating a lot of the information um, because there are slightly different followers that you get on these channels. TikTok, there's something I haven't pushed myself out of my comfort zone enough on TikTok. That needs to come. I'll put on my big girl pants one day and do that. Um, I don't get me wrong. I put up videos, but don't really show myself. Um, I I need <laughs> more of that. There there are some shorts from uh, from these interviews that I've got them all there that I've not put them up. So let's oh, wow. uh, yeah back there, Rachel. Yeah. I'll put out a short from this interview and that'll be it get us both yeah, and I'll get it shared <laughs> let me know when you've done it <laughs> so uh, your your story seems like it's a real just the resilience you know the yeah from all of the all of the things that you've done and like if that didn't work or circumstances change I'm to do something else and then COVID and you know all it's just a an an amazing story of resilience that you've yeah. um that you've got there and the that everything that you've done through your career and your you you have you are are an entrepreneur um <laughs> your entrepreneurial journey has been about about your family and your lifestyle is that right oh yeah I, yeah definitely especially since having the kids um I mean. Even prior to having the kids, you know, I worked more hours than than Alan did, and and that's my husband. I don't think I mentioned his name in. <laughs> and uh, when we moved in together, I told him I'm near your mother, you know. <laughs> so even from the get go, I was like, right, whoever's home first starts cooking tea. That's just the rule. So I am very lucky, and he's been he's been on board with that. <laughs> and we even with the kids, you know, it was very much a shared thing it used to bug me when people say oh is he babysitting tonight no he's been a dad actually he's he's you know half of the parenting team <laughs> you know so it, it meant I could go out in the in the evenings and weekends and, and do what needed to be done and I think resiliency is something that any business still surviving now after COVID they've all got that um because there have been a lot that have gone tatties over the side because of because of COVID, the challenges, the increases in prices. Um, I mean, this kind of business, we're fortunate in that we don't have to pay um, for premises, rent, rates, etc. Welcome to my living room, you know. <laughs> you know, we're fortunate that we don't have those costs. We have a, a different costs, but but not ones as, as massive as that. Um, you know, things like paying the electric bills and stuff like that. I mean, working from home, obviously, we, we've got electric and gas and things like that to pay for here, but not the business rates that, that people are paying out there for premises. Um, I mean, there are businesses like ours that do have warehouses and all these kinds of things, but we haven't needed that just yet. <laughs> never say never, but, um, you know, we haven't had those costs. So, yeah, I think any business that's, that's still going now should give themselves a pat on the back because... This last three four years have just been mind boggling. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I've got another question for you. Um, <laughs> what's it like running a business with your husband? <laughs> um, well, you say that, but actually, he still works full time. Um, doing other things. So, so he drives a, he drives lorries. Um, so his name might be on the business, but he just rocks up for a live draw video and goes hiya here's me um and actually I do 99% of everything else so <laughs> if anything happened to me he'd be lost he wouldn't have a clue <laughs> competition business would see he'd be like uh no no again <laughs> um so yeah I, I mean and it's not that you know I, I discount him completely because we do discuss you know we discuss prizes we discuss um things to try because um, on the learning curve front, it's we're still very much on the learning curve and trying different things to to see what our our players find popular or what they don't. Or he might have seen something that thought, oh, hey, that would make a great prize. And I thought, oh, yeah, that might actually. Let's give that a whirl. Um, so, you know, we do, we do sort of bounce things off of each other. But workload-wise, um, you know, with regards to the website, listing new competitions, posting things up on social media, I do all of that and he shares stuff <laughs> once I've put them all up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've been together 26 years actually this year. So it's we're very used to each other. <laughs> and uh, don't get me wrong, there's an odd disagreement here and there, but nothing catastrophic. So. 
So has he has he been your biggest supporter? Um. Yes, oh, definitely. And that obviously, I have changed jobs and careers quite a few times over over the time that we've been together. But I guess I am. Yes, he's supported me. I cannot deny that in the slightest. But he's also not had an option because I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense um you know I'd, uh, and and I guess he knows me enough to know that I'll do whatever's needed to be done to make things work to make it successful um to know and and actually since he left his job with the council he's had a few wee changes in there <laughs> as well so he, he can't he yeah. can't hold that against me now yeah I think no I think you're um you're very inspiring Rachel I think it's it's a great story <laughs> What can we what can we do to encourage other women to start or scale their businesses? Um I guess it's a believing in yourself that you can you can do whatever you need to do. You know it might be scary. It might be something that you need to research a, a lot of depending on what your business is. You know you might think oh I would like to do that but I don't know how. Um find out look ask people um you know you, you just you can do it whatever it is that you want to do you can it might take work to get there it might take time to get there because some people want things tomorrow and that doesn't necessarily <laughs> happen that way um but yeah you can you can do it just you just have to believe yourself if you're willing to put the work in you can get there whatever it is that you want to be brilliant message just sums up the interview perfectly <laughs> um, thank you very much for being on the scale her up podcast rachel thank you for inviting me brenda it's been, it wasn't quite as nerve-wracking as i thought it was going to be <laughs> just a blather and a cup of coffee with me yeah. we do it all the time yeah yeah definitely <laughs>